one of the harder parts. So we got the stream going. Welcome back, everybody. I just put up a formative assessment for you to work on. So that'll be due Monday night, a review of all of the IRT topics that we've talked about so far. Have your next homework ready yet? But that's because I am delaying it by a week. So you get a week off where there's nothing due. How exciting is that? So let me get the, uh, pull up the course webpage here, make sure I get my dates correctly stated. I just changed this a few hours ago. Because I want to make sure that we get a chance to get um, through the ordinal models. And so since we were a week off of schedule, that's trickled down to this point in the semester. So yes, here we are. We are in week nine. And I have formative assessment four ready for you in ICON under quizzes. You get a week off and then on the ninth is when your next homework will be due. And that will be another one that's an online version where you get a chance to make M plus do your bidding using canned data. And then another formative assessment and then before Thanksgiving break homework five. And so I know we don't have school on the week of Thanksgiving break, but I wanted to give you a few extra days to get that in just in case that would be useful. So rather than making it due the Friday before, I'm putting homework five on the Monday. So, so formative assessment, the only thing you need to be working on, I get to be working on grading everything. So that gives me a chance to get caught up for one shining moment as well. Alrighty. So, now we're finally at the point where we can see some of this stuff in action. It took a long time because I had to wind my way all the way through item factor analysis. So what M plus actually estimates in terms of these models for binary, binary outcomes from a latent predictor are loadings and thresholds. For binary data, the output will also include the discriminations and difficulties that you were introduced to in the context of IRT. So just to remind you what all of these things mean, they are algebraically rearrangements of each other. So it's all in the way that you try to describe what the model parameters mean. It's very tricky sometimes to figure out what your software is doing, and that will especially be the case in the polytomist models. But for binary models, we start, look at uh, slide 62 here at the bottom. We're working with models that have two parameters per item. One of them is B in the notation. That's item difficulty. That is your item location. The definition of B is that it is the amount of the latent trait needed to have a 50% probability of providing a response of one. So how much trait do you need to have a shot at getting that item correct or endorsing that item. That's what B means. So it's where sort of on the trait, if you think of the idea of people and items as sharing the same metric, the same conjoint scale, where on the trait is that item? That's B. I like B as a definition of location infinitely better than thresholds or intercepts. A is the other IRT parameter of interest and that is discrimination. That corresponds to the slope of the item characteristic curve at the 50-50 mark. So let me show you a picture that we looked at last time to remind you of those two in particular. So this is going to be the model predicted probability of response for item one in the example we're about to do where this is slide 63, by the way, if you want to follow along. The y-axis is the probability of answering one on that item. The x-axis is your theta. So as a review, give me all of the synonyms that go with theta that you've heard this semester. You can use your voices or the chat window, your choice. F, what does F stand for? Factor, ah, not factor loading. So the terminology matters, factor score. A factor loading is a slope. A factor loading is an item thing. 
theta or factor is a person thing. So if you want to talk about how people differ in their trait, they differ in their thetas, they differ in their ability, I'll take that, they differ in their latent trait, latent factor, latent variable, latent construct, uh, any others? I can think of one more from classical test theory. What's the idea? Total equals blank plus E. <laughs> T, yeah, true score. Yep, same idea. So people differing from each other in the thing you're trying to measure. That's theta. Theta has a scale that is either set by fixing the mean and the variance to constants that you choose or by fixing one of these sets of item parameters. In this instance, we're working with theta whose scale is set as a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And so this x-axis is showing plus or minus one standard deviations of the trait. So that would be, if theta were normally distributed, roughly 68% of the sample. So this item has a B value estimated from the data of negative 0.376. So that is the location on the x-axis that corresponds to this drop line right here. That's the point where this curve crosses 50-50. So in order to have a 50-50 shot at answering this item correctly or endorsing this item, then you need to have at least a theta of negative 0.4. So is this a relatively easy item or a relatively hard item? Do higher B values correspond with easier items or more difficult items? Yeah, higher B values correspond with harder items. So difficulty is finally in the right direction. So that means that this item, because it's on the negative side, is a relatively easy item relative to our, our theta mean of zero. So if an item is harder, it takes more of a theta to get it right. That would result in a high positive B value. So the slope of the line the, the black line here, that's my best PowerPoint rendition of a tangent line to the curve. The slope of the line is your A parameter. And so given that this entire slope is nonlinear, I'm being very specific. It's the slope at this location specifically that's given by A. And so A indicates item discrimination. It, it indicates how related the item is to the trait. So it corresponds to, as the trait goes up, what happens to the probability of an item response of one. And if an IFA solution, so item factor analysis, or if you see words in your reports, uh, CFA with categorical data, okay, that's IFA, that's what I'm talking about. If someone says they did CFA with categorical data and they used diagonally weighted least squares or WLSMV, they're talking about the other parameters here. Another way of expressing the same model. So it works out that if your factor variance is set to one, that the A discrimination parameter that we know from IRT is the exact same thing as the factor loading that we would use in a CFA model. So we are doing this equation, stop that, right here, the middle one with the threshold. So your factor loading that you knew from um, CFA, the change in the item response for a one unit change in the factor, that loading is the same thing as A if factor variance is one. So that's one to one correspondence. Now the other thing, this negative tau part, that is a location parameter known as a threshold. And to understand what that means, it's easier to think of it in the positive version, which is an intercept. So an intercept always 
everywhere in st statistics is the expected outcome when your predictors are zero. That's always what an intercept means. The key to figuring that out is to figure out what is the outcome and what are the predictors. So the outcome of these models is the logit or probit transformed item response. So the nonlinear transformation of probability is what is being predicted directly by this linear model. And factor or theta is the predictor. So putting that together, my intercept is the expected logit when the factor is zero. So that value corresponds to the red line going down to the x-axis when theta is zero what is the logit of the probability of a 1? And according to the model results, that is 1.629. That is the logit of the probability. So logit is the log of the odds of the probability of a 1. If I unlogit that and inverse link back down to probability, that corresponds to a probability of 0.84. And so if I go over to the y-axis, that's where it ends up at again, to the best of my PowerPoint drawing abilities. So B and intercept are trying to tell you the same thing, but from a different point of reference. B is in reference to a logit of zero. At what point on the x-axis do we hit a logit of zero? Intercept is saying, given an x of zero, what is the corresponding logit? So intercepts are relative to a factor score of zero. B values are relative to a logit of zero. But they're both location ideas. But intercepts is not what you're going to get out of M plus. That would be too easy. What you get out of M plus is an intercept multiplied by negative one. And that thing is known as a threshold. So let me scroll back to an early, early slide that will help, I think, remind you of how we can think about this. Let me find it. Here it is. I'm on slide. I want to go back to slide eight for just a second. So in the initial mapping between probability and logits, if a probability of 0.9 corresponds to a logit of 2.2. So a probability of 0.9 means 90% ones. That corresponds to a logit of 2.2. Another way of saying the exact same thing is if you have 90% ones, you have 10% zeros. 10% zeros corresponds to a logit of negative 2.2. So when the reference is the probability of a zero, this is a threshold. When the reference is the probability of a one, this is an intercept. So an intercept gives you the predicted logit, the predicted log of the odds of the probability of a 1. So to get to the threshold, if you multiply that by minus 1, that means the threshold has to be telling you the logit of the probability of a 0 instead. And this is hella confusing because the rest of the model, in terms of the factor loading multiplied by the factor, is still trying to predict the probability of a 1 crazy. The reason why it's thresholds and not intercepts is to be consistent with the definition of difficulty. Where there's a minus sign in the IRT equations, it's theta minus b. And so they stick the minus in front of the intercept to create that threshold so that the direction of the location parameters stays the same. Let me go back to my picture. So back to slide 63 then. So what you're going to get on your output are loadings and thresholds. But if you want to make your thresholds intercepts so that you can interpret them more easily, change the sign. OK. 
Okay, I hear someone talking. Does anyone want to ask me questions? You want to see how to do this in M plus then? Yay! Here we are. Let me move this thingy out of the way. So this is example five. So we are working with real data, so I don't have the original data to send you as part of the examples, but the output files for all of the models in this example are available in the, M the example five compressed folder. Uh, the top of each output file, just to remind you, has all of this input. So if you're looking for like a starter syntax, you can copy from those output files directly to get you started without having to type all of this from scratch. So the context of this example is these are data from very, very old people. These are data I borrowed from the Octogenarian Twin Study of Aging, which is a study of same-sex Swedish twins. I am ignoring the fact that they are twins for the purposes of this class. <laughs> uh, if you want to know what to do with them instead, come to one of my other classes about multi-level modeling and we'll get into that. So I have 635 older adults and they are answering seven questions about basic activities of daily living. And there are two different versions of the answers to this question. So in this example, I'm working with just the binary version, and I will show you the ordinal version next week. Um, but zero means that they need help with the given activity, and one means that they do not need help. So that's what we are saying, whether or not they can do each of these things. And so number one is housework, meaning cleaning and laundry. Two is bed making, cooking, shopping, and so forth. And I've also given you the percentages as to how many people answered that they do not need help to do this. So just staring at these percentages, which item is the hardest? Got to vote for number five. Uh, five is second hardest. Number one, yeah. S only 64% of the people said they can do their own housework. 64% instead of 65%, so very close. Uh, what item is the easiest? Number seven, yes. Using the phone, and yes, this refers to a landline. These data were collected in the 1990s, so that will be relevant in looking at some of the other results with this sample. So these are old people collected a long time ago. So we're going to see whether or not these seven items are consistent with the idea of a single latent dimension, such that we can use them to characterize someone's propensity to live independently as the latent trait. So this is not an ability um, in the traditional educational sense, but it is an important ability in the life sense. So I have two different versions of the same model here on this slide so that I could point out how they differ from each other. So let me start on the left-hand side here. So most of the syntax you are familiar with. I have a title. I have the data. Uh, the default is that it's free format and individual level, so you can type those if you want, but you don't have to. Names. So this line refers to every single column that's in your data set, and this is a comma separated values data set. So case is my ID number. I have seven items in the binary format, so that's the D prefix for dichotomous, and then I have the same seven items in the ordinal categorical format, so that's the C. So I have an ID variable and then 14 columns, and then this part is going to be critical because I'm not using all the items. So what use variables does is subset just the things you're working with in this current model. So I'm only trying to predict the dichotomous seven items. I'm not using the other ones yet. Here's the magic one. This makes everything happen. It's beautiful. It's the word categorical. 
you tell it that these indicators are categorical and it automatically figures out what kind of model each one needs based on how many categories it has. So for binary items, it's going to fit the models that we've been talking about. For uh, ordinal items, it will fit an alternative version of this model that uses a cumulative link function instead. We'll get there next week. Kelly appreciates this. Yes, it is very nice, isn't it? Yeah, it just it's like, yeah, I got this. Yeah, you just one I told you last week, remember? I told you one more line of code. This is it. Uh, you still need to tell it about any missing data that you have. So this is telling it that if it comes across a 99999, that means missing data. So it's not filling in the values for you. It's just telling them, given this value, ignore it and don't treat it as a real value. And then an ID function, um, if you were to save factor scores or save other pieces of output that were individual level, it would add the ID variable column to that data set so that you could merge it back into your other data. In terms of analysis, um, this you've seen before, type equals general, estimator equals ML. So for these models, I'm not using MLR, I'm only using ML. That's because I'm not assuming any kind of normality here. MLR is a robust correction that we used in the context of CFA, because in CFA the items were supposed to be normally distributed. I'm not telling it that they're normally distributed. I'm telling it that they're categorical. So it knows to fit either a Bernoulli distribution for binary, or it's going to fit a multinomial for the categorical versions that we see next week. So there's no need for a robust correction. Uh, link equals logit. This is a default, but I wanted to put it here explicitly because you do get a choice. If you are estimating your models using maximum likelihood, then you can choose if you want your scale to be logits or probits. That is not the case if you are estimating your model using something else that we haven't talked about yet. And because in previous classes in teaching these models, I discovered that slightly different operating systems will give you slightly different results for certain terms. I wrote the M plus people about this problem and they said to add this additional tighter convergence criterion to keep that from happening. So this is my best shot at making it so that the models that I run on my computer will be the, give the same results as the ones that you run on your virtual desktop. I'm hoping. But if you start your homework uh, number four, and you get stuck on something and it's not working, let me know, because it could be that problem rearing its ugly head again. I really hope not. But that, So we're adding that line of code to try and prevent that. So any questions on just the input part so far? Question in the chat window. Is it right that by using estimator equals ml link equals logit, that is the same as the weighted least squares? No. That is a different thing. We haven't talked about weighted least squares yet, but briefly, uh, what I am asking it to do with maximum likelihood is what's known as full information maximum likelihood. It is creating a likelihood function for each person based on their responses using a Bernoulli distribution and after integrating across uh, theta. We haven't talked about that aspect of it yet, but it's, it's a full information approach. The alternative way of estimating these models, which is a, a weighted least squares estimator, is limited information. It's going to start with a summary of the responses first and then do a factor analysis on that summary. So that is an alternative that we haven't talked about yet. It is not the same thing. Historically speaking, the term IRT means that you are going to interpret A and B item parameters and you're going to get them through full information maximum likelihood. Historically, the term item factor analysis means that you are going to get intercepts and slopes or thresholds and slopes and estimate them using weighted least squares. So those two names confound ways of talking about the model and ways of estimating the model. But you can have the off cells too. So for instance, this is a full information analysis, full information analysis where I'm going to start with slopes and thresholds, but also get the A's and B's at the same time.
So both solutions will be part of this analysis. Uh, could you please explain again why it's okay to use ML instead of robust ML? Sure. So robust ML was what I used as a default in estimating CFA models. So CFA model is a linear model where theta factor scores back then were supposed to be uh, predicting the item responses directly with a linear effect of the factor and the item responses were supposed to be normally distributed. The R part of MLR is a robust correction that adjusts the fit statistics and the standard errors of the parameters for excess multivariate kurtosis. So more details about how that works is in um, Ender's chapter five, which is on your reading list. I highly recommend that because that he explains it pretty damn clearly. Um, but in this case, I'm not assuming anything about my items being normal. The fact that I told M plus that they're categorical means that it will fit either a Bernoulli distribution to each if it's binary or a multinomial distribution to each. So there's not that assumption of normality that I'm trying to fix or otherwise make it okay enough because there is no normal distribution at work for the item responses. All of these models assume that theta is normally distributed, but that's not what MLR is supposed to correct for. Theta doesn't exist. Other questions? Okay. About good. the robust? Yeah. Um, is it true that if even if you did MLR, that it wouldn't make a difference? I thought that was said at another point. Yes. Um, if, if, they, if there is no difference, then the solutions should map onto each other. Like MLR would simplify to being regular flavor ML. Um, I didn't want there to be yet another potential reason for differences across results. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying, this is my attempt to sort of simplify because there's other things, there's other choices that I have to make in this with respect to how many um, quadrature points there are. And so that's another thing that could make results different across programs. So that this is sort of my nod of a simplification, but yes, in theory, it should make no difference. If you were going to fit a model that had some continuous items and some binary items at the same time, you could MLR the whole thing. And it would fix the parts that needed fixed and leave the rest of it alone if it's not applicable. Good questions. Um, one more. By using link equals logit, we are getting the probability of getting the the one for the B parameter, if not, we are getting the threshold. Uh, no, what we're gonna get, whether we like it or not, are loadings and thresholds. For binary data, it also spits out the A's and the B's. The question is, with respect to the link, what is the scale of the model for the nonlinear transformation of probability? So logits is the log of the odds of the probability of a one and the logit metric corresponds to a variance in the logit scale of 3.29. The alternative is probit, which is known as a normal ogive in IRT land, and that corresponds to the z-score that goes with those conditional probabilities that covers the area to the left. And that metric has a variance of one instead. So it's, it's two different scalings of the imaginary latent variable that underlies your binary response. And you can pick either one when you're using full information maximum likelihood, but you are stuck with probits if you're using limited information uh, weighted least squares. Okay, thanks for all the questions. And there's one more. So we will get thresholds in M plus. So we get the log of the odds of the probability of a zero. Yes, we do. Yes, that's exactly what we're going to get. And if you don't want to explain to your readers what the hell a threshold is, flip the sign and it's an intercept. Uh, I believe in certain R packages for item response models, it is slopes and intercepts that they get. I don't know if anyone can confirm that. Um, you really have to look at the documentation of your package to see what they're giving you because there's all these analogous and sometimes not clearly named ways of looking at the same thing. But in M plus, it is thresholds and loadings. Okay. 
So good with the first part then? Like FlexMert for IRT, yes. Is FlexMert slope intercept? I think that is correct as well. So you got to know, though. That's, that's my take home message is read the documentation. So the new part then, very little new part for the model. So we specify the latent factor the same way as before. Factor name, that's eight characters or fewer, the word by, and then you write out your items. Just to recall, by default, M plus fixes the first loading to one without your permission. So if you're trying for a scaling in which the factor or the theta's variance is fixed to one instead, you need to override that loading default. And so that is why I have the star here. You need the star. What that does is free the loadings for all seven items. We technically only need the star for the first one, but it will write it for the same for the others too, making it explicit then that all seven are free. And because you can do this method of abbreviation, I would highly encourage you to name your items so that you can take advantage of this. So if you have a common stem with a numeric suffix, then it understands that when you write 1 to 7, it means 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And so that's consistent with how I declared the variable names up here. Now this thing, there's a new character in here. Talked about this at the end of the last class. So normally if something's in brackets, what model parameter does that refer to in M plus? Do you remember? What are brackets for? Intercepts or means, correct. So it is a mean if you're talking about a predictor it is an intercept if you're talking about an outcome. Analogously, the dollar sign is used to represent a threshold. In the case of binary items, there's only one threshold per item because you're talking about the shift from an answer of zero to one. And where does that shift occur? So threshold one dash threshold seven is talking about the threshold, one threshold for each item. And I am saying that I want them all to be estimated. Last but not least, for identification, the name of my factor is IADL for, for independent activities of daily living. I'm fixing its mean to zero by putting that in brackets, and I'm fixing its variance to one by uh, the at one sign. If you forget this part, the mean of zero is a default. You don't have to type it. But the default for latent factors is to estimate their variance instead. So you got to make sure that you fix the variance to one if that's how you want to identify your model. And then correspondingly, you have the star there to make sure that all of your loadings are estimated. So let me ask you this. Two different ways you can screw this up, right? What would happen if I did that? So I took away the at one and I changed it to a star. What am I telling it to do? Are you saying don't don't fix it to anything? Don't fix it to anything. So what is the it in that sentence? The factor you're talking about? The factor what? IADL. The, but, but what property of the factor? Which, um, someone said variance. Yes, variance. Yeah, so, f so yes, you are letting the factor variance be whatever it wanted. So if I let the factor variance be whatever it wanted, and I let all the loadings be whatever they want, what do I have? Uh, 
I have a mess. That's what I have. I have an unidentified model. Something's got to be one somewhere. So the mean side is going to be identified because the factor mean is fixed to zero. That way we can estimate all of the thresholds. But if you try to estimate the factor variance and all the factor loadings, it doesn't know what the scale of the factor is with respect to its variability. So we can't do both. So let me put that factor variance back to one. Now the other way you can screw this up is to have the factor variance set to one but forget your star. Now this way is more insidious because it will still run. The model is identified if you do this, but what have you done? That all your items do equal to each other, the loadings? Good guess, but no. That's actually what's going to happen on the other side of the page with this constraint. Yeah, it's not obvious at all from the code what's going to happen. Can you highlight the line you're talking about? Because I was looking away at my notes and looked back and didn't see what you changed. Yep. Hang on. This. OK, thank you. So we're talking about what happens with the star there versus not there. Can I make another guess? Yep. <laughs> Are they all just going to be the, da their, the data if they're not estimated? Some of them are going to be estimated and one of them isn't. Okay. Is it just dials or the, uh, la the seventh one isn't? Nope. You would <laughs> think that, but no. <laughs> yeah. So here's, let me make this more explicit. Uh, what M plus does by default is this. Okay, by default, it fixes the first one to one and it estimates all the others. So if you forget your star like this, then it's still going to fix the first one to one and estimate all the others. But you've already fixed your factor variance to one. So if you fix the first loading to one and the factor variance to one, then you're saying item one is perfect. So it's like a double constraint. And it is totally not obvious from the code that that would happen, which is why I'm trying to make the point of it. So yes, and it would be very problematic if item one is a bad item. It's almost guaranteed to make your model fit poorly unless item one is spectacular. So star here to make sure that all the loadings get estimated, including the first one, because you've already identified the model by fixing the factor variance to one. Um, can you choose one or the other theoretically? Like you could either not have the star, but you can't both. You could either not have the star or not fix the, not have the star and fix it to one or I think I'm saying it backwards. So you one or the either needs to be one. Okay, that's what I was trying to say. Yeah, so what you could do, another variant that's acceptable, is to estimate the factor variance and take the star away, which means the first loading is fixed to one and the factor variance is estimated. Okay. That is also acceptable in terms of identification but then the variance of the theta is not going to be in a z-score metric. So it becomes a little bit harder to interpret what a unit change in theta means because it's not going to correspond to a one unit change. So we're going to put our star here, put an at one here, and that estimates all the loadings, including the first one, and it fixes the factor variance to one. The rest of this, by the way, I sometimes put this part up above. It doesn't actually matter what order these are in. Um, this is for a standardized solution. This is for local fit. We'll talk more about what Tech 10 is and in, in later and to generate factor scores and then to generate plots. And I was wrong in the email that I sent. You do need plot three to get your factor score histograms. I thought it was plot one, but I stand corrected.
So all the rest of this, with the exception of Tech 10, looks exactly like it did before. So this model that I'm asking it to do is otherwise known as a 2PL. Each item gets its own loading, therefore it gets its own A discrimination. Each item gets its own location parameter, which is phrased as a threshold, but which will become a difficulty. And there's no upper or lower asymptotes being estimated. M plus can do those models, but they don't correspond directly to the factor analysis models, and they tend not to be as useful for items that are not correct or incorrect. So we're, we're not doing those, but they can be done. So other questions on the setup or the content? So on the other side of the page is code that looks almost identical except for one word. The right column is showing an alternative model that is the 1PL, the one parameter logistic model, otherwise known as our friend the Rosh model. Can you find the one word that makes this different? Kelly found it. Yeah, so what's the difference between the models in terms of specification? The 2PL lets each item have its own slope, its own loading, whereas the 1PL constrains all the slopes, the loadings, to be the same. So this right here, that's my difference. By putting one label in parentheses for what was supposed to be seven different numbers, I am not only labeling those loadings, I am constraining them to be the same value. So that's how you fit the Roche model. Take the loadings it would have given you separately and force them to be the same. That's crazy. Uh, crazy that they should be the same or crazy that it's that easy? Crazy when you put it that way that like, oh, it just makes you feel like, why would you choose the Roche model if like you're just adding more constraints on it or I don't know. Yeah, that they're that similar to each other. I always thought it was like totally its own thing before this class. Well, let me play reviewer three for a moment here. Um, I think reviewer three today is going to be a valley girl. Is that okay? I only do a couple different imitations, but reviewer three is like, I can't believe you put a 2PL model to this because like, oh my God, that is like so inappropriate. It totally should have been a 1PL and that's why your paper sucks. So I might be exaggerating a scooch, but not by much. Having just gotten a paper back where reviewer three basically tore me a new asshole. This happens. I'm pretty sure he wasn't a valley girl though, but it's funnier when you give them a review in a vocal fry. So how do I respond to my reviewer three? Reviewer three thinks that my 2PL model is bullshit and that I should have fit the Rosh model. So everything that you just said, Andrea, is true, but I got to argue. Can you compare them with Yeah, your... that's where I'm going. The best way to shut a reviewer up is to provide them data. So the, the answer to this question as to which model should be used to me is an empirical question. Which one fits better? Does constraining all the loadings to be the same number hurt the fit? Said differently, does allowing all the loadings to be different make it not better? And you guys already know how to do this. So here's the results from each model. The 2PL results are right here on the left. The 1PL results, the Roche model that reviewer three thinks is everything, are over here. Since we're in regular flavor ML, there's no scaling factors. And we can just take the straight difference between models and multiply it by minus two. So this is our friend, the likelihood ratio test. 
I'm not going to do the math in my head. I'm going to do it down here. So I took each log likelihood and multiplied it by 2 to start with, co corresponding to the spreadsheet and the difference. So the difference in log likelihood, the difference in model heights, is a difference of about 20 on 6 degrees of freedom. Where did the 6 come from? Six loadings, yeah. So one model, the model that's the 2PL has 14 parameters that were estimated. That's because I've got seven items, and each item got its own A and its own B. Seven times two is 14. The 1PL kept each item to have its own B, its own threshold, but it becomes a B, but shared all the A's. So if I go from seven loadings to one loading, seven A's to one A, that's a savings of six. So that's where the difference in uh, for the degrees of freedom came from. So a chi-score value of about 20 on six degrees of freedom is a significant result. So what do I tell reviewer three? See, Reviewer 3's response is going to have two versions. There's going to be the version you write, and then there's the anger translator version. Right. Do you know the key and peel show? We have the, uh, the, the anger translator. If you haven't seen this, it's pretty hysterical. They, they do a great imitation of uh, various politicians and their anger translators, how they would actually respond. The anger translator version would be suck it, Reviewer 3. But that's not what I'm going to write. So how do I respond? I've got a significant difference in fit between these two models. What does that tell me? The Roche model, yeah, the Roche model fits worse. The model with fewer parameters fits worse. The model with more parameters fits better. So you can either say that relative to a model where all the loadings are different, making them the same significantly decreased model fit, it made the data shorter. Or you can say that relative to the Roche model, that model in which all the loadings were different made the fit better. So the response would go something like this. Dear reviewer three, we think you made an excellent point about the need to compare alternative models, and we have taken your suggestion into account, as now stated explicitly on page whatever. The likelihood ratio test de describing the model comparison indicated that the Roche model fit significantly worse, and therefore we retained our original 2PL. Ta-da! And then, um, yeah, go ahead. I missed the part where, where do you look to see that it was a worse fit? Because we don't use negative two log likelihood. Um, I got a spreadsheet for you. That's where I pulled this from, but I did the math down here. So if I take the log likelihood and you can either mi multiply the difference by minus two or multiply each one by minus two and then take the difference. Yeah. Is that the... Ne yeah, you're just doing the negative two log likelihood. So that's my question. You had to calculate that. Okay. I wasn't sure if you were looking at um, the statistics up here where it says p-value because then I was confused about why you could use it there and not in another scenario like what we've been doing for our assignments. And I was like, wait, something changed. But no, <laughs> if it's negative yep. two log likelihood, then it's fine. Yep. It is indeed. And so here's the spreadsheet that goes with example five. And there's minus two log likelihood comparisons as one of the tabs. And so this is a simplified version of the other spreadsheet you used previously because there's no scaling factors. So you could also use the MLR spreadsheet that I had before and put in one for the scaling factor and it works out to be the same thing. But yeah, this is another instance in which you are comparing your HO model, that's your model because you are the HO, mm -hmm. to another version of your HO model. And so that's not something that M plus does for you. You have to do it yourself. 
but how well does my model fit? This is all I get. Notably, what's not next to my HO model that usually is next to my HO model? Yeah, H1. It's gone. It's gone forever. That's because there's no answer key here. So we haven't talked about estimation, but there is no H1 model. The H1 model is a contingency table of every possible combination of item response pattern. So without an H1 model, there's no RMSEA, there's no R SRMR, and there's also no null model, which means there's no CFI, no TLI, none of that. It's all gone. So we're going to have to do something else to look at global fit. So at this point, I don't know how well my model fits in an absolute sense. What I do know is that a model that has different loadings across items fits better than a model where they are the same. So reviewer three totally could have nailed me on absolute model fit. And that I would have had to work harder to respond to. So we'll talk about that in a bit, but let's see the solutions. So we're looking at the solution for the 2PL. So it's one set of output that's continuing across the two columns. And unstandardized model results is what shows up first. So these are your factor loadings. Question then, so the piercing chi-square, is that still compared to a perfect model? It is, but the perfect model is the giant contingency table. And if you don't have enough people to fill out all of the patterns, then that piercing chi-square is garbage. So it basically won't be used except in cases in which you have thousands and thousands of people and very few items. So mostly all is garbage. Yep. Yep. So here's my model results though. These are loadings. These are really big numbers for loadings. They're in a logit scale though, and that's why. So these give me the change in the logit of the item response for a one unit change in the trait. Then we have this thing the thresholds. And I have added the definitions here for you to help us out. The threshold is the expected logit of a zero response when the trait score is zero. And these are in logits as well. So for instance, if I went with my easiest item, number seven, that threshold is almost negative six. So that corresponds to a very, very tiny probability. So the, a very, very small chance of not being able to do this item. That's what a threshold corresponds to, the probability of a zero. So the logit of not being able to do this, if you're a person of average ability, is negative six, very, very tiny chance of not being able to do it. And so that would be an intercept, yep, of take the minus sign off. So get rid of that and ta-da, it's an intercept. So that means the logit of the probability of being able to do it is a logit of six for someone with average ability. So very, very likely that they would be able to answer the phone. And this is why I don't like thresholds. In addition to them being complicated, they often give you logits that are really, really large in absolute value. And it's hard to conceptualize those in terms of the corresponding probabilities because they're all relative to what is expected for an average person. They don't tell you where the item is. They tell you where the outcome is for an average person. 
this unstandardized solution will also be given in a standardized form and it gives you standardized loadings and you can see that these are really high meaning that these are all pretty good items one thing I want to point out though you have to resist the urge to use these to calculate Omega because these loadings are dependent on where the item is in terms of its difficulty the idea of a constant amount of reliability implied by these items is not appropriate so we're not going to do that uh, standardized thresholds are provided I have no idea what one would do with those in practice I typically ignore those and just as before the standardized loading squared gives you your R squares so that's my IFA solution in terms of predicting the logit of the response from thresholds which are backwards intercepts and loadings and then over here is the IRT parameterization so it gives you discriminations as the A's and it gives you difficulties as the B's so do you see anything in common between the loadings and the A's this is a softball question loadings versus A's anything in common they're the same yeah they're exactly the same and that will be the case if theta has a variance of one thresholds and difficulties are both getting at the idea stop it of location but they're not the same they're not telling you the same they're not they're not telling you the same thing they're getting at the same idea though so difficulties tell you how much theta you need to hit 50 50 probability so where the item is on the trait is given by difficulty and if we look at these numbers which item is the easiest number seven we got a couple votes for does that surprise you nope it was the one where 94 percent of the sample could do it so yeah that classical test theory information is showing up here again the only difference is that that these are um, it's a conditional model after taking into account the trait but item 7 for instance it's, it is the smallest number that means it's the easiest item it takes the least amount of theta to have a 50 50 probability so somebody who is uh, 1.8 standard deviations below the mean has a 50 50 probability of being able to answer the phone and which item is the hardest number one same as before so it takes a theta of minus 0.4 to be able to have a 50 50 probability now here's some foreshadowing the idea of reliability for this scale what do you think it implies that all of these difficulties are negative what kind of person are these items going to measure with good sensitivity is it people who can't do it yeah low people yeah so these yes. items are all negative that means they're all on the low side of theta in terms of where they're located so that means we're going to have information about people of low ability but we don't have any items that are above zero we don't have any information about people who are above zero that's not going to be good so down here I have used the model parameters to describe 
how the model would create predicted logits in either IFA formwork, uh, framework or IRT framework, but I want to show you some pictures. So these are pictures that I made in Excel, but I took them out of information that was given by M+. So before I do that, one question, can you talk about how thresholds and difficulties are different again? My Wi-Fi got spotty. Yes. So thresholds are giving you the expected logit of a zero response for somebody with average ability for a factor score of zero. Item difficulties are the Bs. That is the trait level needed to get to a logit of zero, which is a 50-50 probability. So they're both parameters that correspond to location, location relative to a different zero point, where logit is zero for item difficulty, where theta is zero for a threshold. So here are some item characteristic curves. So these are showing what the model says should happen to the probability of a correct response or being able to do it in this case as a function of the item parameters. So item seven is the one that's out here. It's by far the easiest. And here's all of the other ones. Note that their slopes appear relatively parallel, but still the model fit getting better by letting them be separate suggests that a 2PL model is a better description. But note that they all top out after about point, or about zero, right? I've got nothing out here for thetas above zero. So because all of my items are on the easy side, they do not differentiate between people above zero. That creates this test information function right here. Let me zero in on this. So test information is the sum of the information provided by each item, where information is a function of the item's discrimination that controls how high the information is, but it's at the location where the difficulty value is specifically. And so this plot here shows that I have a shit ton of information on the low side. Look at the y-axis. The y-axis goes up to 28. Much better than the two that I had in my dissertation. So I have on here a reference point of 4, and information of 4 corresponds to a level of reliability of 0.8. So the, the equation is information divided by information plus 1 to convert to reliability. So if I take this y-axis and convert it to reliability, that gives me this red picture right here. So in trying to describe reliability of measurement, I can't just say whether or not my test meets conventional levels of reliability. I have to be more specific. So if I were to use a cut point of 0.8, then I would say based on this picture that these items together achieve conventional levels of reliability for somebody of a theta between minus 1.6-ish up to about 0.2. So roughly two standard deviations below the mean, I have a decent level of reliability from these items. But for anybody above the mean, I have literally no information. If somebody can do all of these things, then I have no idea how capable they are because there wasn't anything on the test that they can't do. my estimated factor scores, here's a histogram of them. This shows a ginormous ceiling effect. There were a whole bunch of people who said, yes, I can do all seven of these. And there they are. So even though theta is supposed to be normally distributed, in practice, it depends on the kind of information you have. 
there's no way that I can piece apart people who have a perfect score. So how would I fix this? Let's say that I wanted an instrument who measured people well, not just people who were likely to have problems, but people who were relatively self-sufficient. What if I wanted to convert this to a measure more acceptable for, say, a younger population or a more general population without deficits? What do I need to do? Make more difficult items. Yeah, I need to find things that people who are really with it would say they can't do. Like uh, train for a marathon. Brave the shopping crowds on Black Friday in person. Uh, be able to file your own taxes with TurboTax. I don't know, what are the activities of daily living? These things are sort of a mix of physical and cognitive things, but you get the idea. I need to put items in here that high people would say they can't do to figure out where somebody is on the high side. So this scale of seven items, for certain purposes, if my goal is to figure out who needs help living independently, this works pretty well. If my goal is to measure everybody well, this does not work. And so this idea of trying to figure out where the holes in your measurement are is a very useful property, I think, of IRT. Rather than just pretending like you're